So one of the things that I feel is you know very important uh, from an engineering standpoint and trying to re maintain the cutting edge on the planet is to look at all the varieties of technology. And so tubes were you know clearly a first choice in my mind uh, with my background in uh, production and engineering mm -hmm. audiophile records for for David Chesky in particular Chesky Records, uh, and most people look at the tubes and say, "Oh, that's last century, or that's ancient technology." You know, it's, and in particular that it has a sonic characteristic that usually is termed warm, or some variation thereof that is not anything close to being neutral. And in contrast to something like the solid state amplifier, this one being the Mark Levinson number thirty three H which would be you know, an equivalent solid-state uh, design approach and uh, uh, you know, uh, sonic, uh, the ability for it to sonically reveal similar types of neutrality to, to what the tubes are. But what I would, of course, point out is that you know, at retail, this is about a $7,200 amp without all the bells and whistles that I've worked in. And this, I believe, is $15,000, you know, give, give or take twice as, as much. Certainly, part of that is because in a solid state amplifier, you've got to have at least twice as many components doing the job, if not more, that these very simple vacuum tubes gotcha. would. And all of that design work has to be done before the product actually comes out. Otherwise, the sonic character of it will change as time goes by. The tube option has given me you know, a simpler approach where I can choose to test any of the varieties of tubes from $20 on up to $800, let's say, and see what the quality differences are between the type of tube manufacturing or the very specific nature of the way in which, uh, say, a KT-88 can be designed, or in this case, we could put in uh, a KT-89 or a KT-90 or an EL-34. Okay. Turns out the KT-88 is what the amp is designed to work with. It does sound the best. There might be a case where the speaker would sound better with one of the different tubes, and if it didn't have the choice of such a fine, transparent chassis to begin with and being able to use the tubes to tune for the speaker load, we would have to choose a different solid-state so, amp as an alternative. So the, the fact that at can, least twice the price. The fact that, that you can be interchangeable with the, the tubes allows you to tailor this to a, sp a specific particular speaker. Exactly. I tried to say specific speaker, but that wasn't working. And as much in the same way as, you know, my f design philosophy has to include at least 50% of the equipment, 50% uh, to the room, and then 50% to integrating it all together. So even though that's 150%, most people don't consider the room as a vital factor, but the speaker is going to be very specific to the uh, position in a room and the shape and uh, acoustic characteristic of that room. And the amplifier is going to be, you know, speaking through that speaker to the room back to the audience. So all of these factors have to be taken into account as, as a whole. As a whole. Yeah. And so uh, I happen to like the Mark Levinson in this particular room, in this particular system, for use in the subwoofers. So covering anything below, say, 80 hertz. It does sound very, very good as a full range amplifier, but with the snells that I'm using here, because uh, you know of their very narrow dispersion characteristic designed by George Lucas and Tomlinson Holman for their very first THX adventure into the home, that being the Snell music and cinema reference loudspeakers, uh, the, the mating of the sound of, uh, uh, characteristics in the room and with the amp produces uh, uh, the verisimilitude of being there, much more so with the tube amp than it does with any of the solid state alternatives. Gotcha. And now, one of the things you had mentioned that people had been curious about is, is the impact of the subwoofer on the crown amp. Can you demonstrate where this is, how this is isolated from any kind of vibration or harm from the, the subsonic Absolutely. Waves. Uh, clearly, you know, tubes have a reputation of being microphonic and changing their sound in particular under conditions of high SPL. But this is simply not true, uh, except in the case of poorly manufactured tubes or tubes which are old or not integrated properly into a uh, uh, chassis to produce results which are independent of the vibration around them. However, being that we do have such large woofers and there are 16 of them and the amplifiers are in such close proximity, uh, the, each of the amplifiers, and in fact all the components in the system, are on two separate sets of vibration suspension support, one of which is spring-based and the other is rubber band or O-ring based, thereby effectively lowering any chassis resonance down to two hertz or below. And while I'm not going to say that it wouldn't potentially sound better if we had the 
amplifiers and the speakers outside of the room, uh, if you will, a room within a room, and we could isolate the amplification technology from any ambient sound. Uh, the testing so far has produced such good results here, I think that you'll be hard pressed to even find any system on the planet that reproduces you know, a more transparent, grain free, you are there effect, even though the amps are sitting right in front of the subwoofers. Gotcha. Let's, uh, let's move around here and see what else we've got. Uh, these are amps for... Those are the Theta digital to analog converters. So gotcha. in, All right. in the uh, middle part of the, the chain from the source to the speakers, uh, the digital data, which has been um, taken from mono all the way on up to an 8-channel SDDS mix, uh, is uh, surround processed by the Casablanca 3 and then sent uh, as a digital signal uh, at double whatever the original sampling frequency was of the source to these Theta companion uh, D to A's, which are the Generation 8. Of course, with a few little minor modifications here and there by mm -hmm. myself. But in essence, uh, they're running at double speed of what the typical Theta product would, uh, you know, if you were to purchase it. And with the idea then of being able to, uh, you know, maintain the eight time over sampling that the Gen 8 is capable of as a unit, but actually be able to run it at double speed and there, thereby, you know, eliminate that much more uh, uh, distortion and resolve that much more detail, even though the detail may or may not have been there in the original recording. So, so as, as good as the, the world has come to understand digital can be, digital can actually be made digitally better. Exactly. So it, it would be like taking, uh, let's say, a current film that's, mm -hmm. that's shot digitally, recorded digitally. Processing it through this would be the equivalent of taking a, a, a piece of celluloid that's scratchy running it through a computer, getting rid of all the scratches, fixing up the color, and then making that as a presentation. I mean, it's that dramatic. Precisely. A good ex you know, uh, visual example would be that, uh, that most recent HD DVD box set of Star Trek, the first uh, season right. the television original series, where they went back to the camera negatives and you know, took uh, new prints, uh, scanned them in, and then went through it frame by frame to do exactly what you're saying, which is to uh, make each frame look as though it was brand new and shot yesterday, uh, has uh, no dust scratches or distortion or frame weave, and at the same time that there are details in that original negative which have never been seen because it would have been printed and then printed again and printed a third time and before then, it even got in front of a movie screen, much less on television. Plus, and they weren't that concerned with it because of the resolution of sets, which at best were like 380 lines. And it was only going to show once yep. under ideal conditions. And ultimately so, they threw it down to 16 millimeter for syndication.